When we exercise, we have uh, a release of myokines. Now, they are muscle-based proteins, let's just call them. When they're released from the skeletal muscle, they can then go out and act on different organs in the body. We know now that we have specific myokines. So let's take IL-6, interleukin-6, for example. This is the most well-studied myokine. It gets secreted when we have a contraction of a muscle. So when you shorten a muscle and we contract it during a bicep curl, let's just imagine, it releases these myokines. The first one we'll talk about is IL-6. We know IL-6 to be this pro-inflammatory cytokine. And that's well and truly true. But when it's released specifically from the muscle, it acts as an anti-inflammatory. So it goes through and it acts as a anti-inflammatory and it can have a, an effect on our immunity and it can have an effect on different areas of the brain, which is fantastic. Today's show with Luisa Nicola, a neurophysiologist to elite athletes, Wall Street executives, many people that you see playing professional basketball on television, she actually coaches. She is a phenomenal person. You are going to learn so many wonderful insights. Now, one thing that I want to remind you about when we talk about the brain, there's a nutrient that is often overlooked, and that is called creatine. Creatine is often considered and used in the context of exercise performance, but guess what? Creatine improves memory, cognition. It's been shown that people who have low creatine intake and low creatine levels have poor cognition and poor mental function. So one of the tools that we can offer you over at Myoscience is the unique combination of electrolytes with creatine in the electrolyte sticks. This is a very popular sought after formulation. There's over 340 some odd reviews because it futures real salt with therapeutic levels of electrolytes. A lot of companies, some of the most popular companies out there selling electrolytes are literally underdosing the magnesium, the potassium, and all the other forms of minerals. And the form of the minerals is not optimal. And that's why we created the electrolyte sticks to not only future optimal forms of electrolytes, but also creatine and taurine. These are synergistic carnitine nutrients that have been shown to support healthy hydration. And creatine has been shown, as we're going to talk about, to improve cognition, reflex, and much more. So I really hope you enjoy the show with Louisa. Check out the electrolyte sticks in the link below. You can also go to myoscience.com, read any one of the 300 plus reviews and use the coupon code podcast to save. That's podcast over at M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience.com. Now, one quick thing before we dive into the show with Louisa. She gave me two of these balls here. If you're just listening in iTunes, you might want to check it out over on YouTube. She, her company is Neuroathletics. Now, what was really unique about these balls is she has a lot of 100 different variations and she has a course that can help you optimize cognition whether you want to perform better in your occupation or on the athletic field, uh, your cognition, your reaction time is very important. So I have found these balls to be very helpful, especially because you, you might be able to sense the congestion in my nose. A lot of people have been cold around me, so I did experience a few symptoms, but thankfully I have a sauna, so I didn't get totally sick. However, what I noticed is my ability to juggle and do reaction drills that Louisa taught me when we stopped recording was diminished. I think it's important to recognize that when you're sick, your body's actually more inflamed. My brain was a little bit inflamed. So I have been now using these balls and using the different drills that Louisa has taught me as a measurement of my cognitive abilities and cognitive health. And we talk a lot about that in today's show. So I want you to take this seriously because this is very important and it might help you catalyze lifestyle changes. For example, let's say you go out drinking and you're like, look, I can drink three glasses of wine, no problem. It doesn't affect me in any way. And then you, you try to juggle in the morning and you can't juggle. That could be a symptom that the ethanol that you like to enjoy that you think is not impacting your brain is actually impairing your cognition. So I really have found these different exercises, juggling and the ball throwing techniques with an open hand against a wall being about 10 meters away has been very effective at helping just to me to get an insight into my cognitive health and make associated lifestyle changes, whether it's going to sleep earlier, eating different foods and all of that. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. Let's cut back to it with Louisa. Well, Louisa, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've been a fan of your Instagram and all the content you put out for a long time. Um, for the listeners who don't aren't familiar with your work, you work with a lot of executives and professional athletes and so forth. And I know you want to get into mTOR and muscle and all that, which is we've talked a lot about that and it's so exciting. But maybe... Um, how did you get into helping people perform at their best? Yeah, first of all, I love your content. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Uh, so I was a triathlete okay. in my day. 
I say in my day because I, I, I was it was a very long time ago, but um, I was an elite triathlete. I raced for Australia, so I really understood what it meant to perform at my peak. So I raced internationally and I started to understand that the brain is pretty much everything that controls my movement from how I pedal to how fast I run to how fast I swim. And that's when I really started to understand, okay, I need to know more about the brain. I need to know more about medicine. And that's when I I decided to make the move. Good for you. Yeah. What was your favorite event when you were an athlete? My favorite was the one that I was best at, and that is swimming. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, so natural born swimmers, because I'm from Australia. Mm -hmm. We're all taught to swim from a young age. And just because I was, I would say I was heavier than most of the other girls that I was competing with. And they were just faster runners than me. Mm. So running was my worst leg. It's hard. Yeah, I did competitive cycling. And so I love oh. to bike and I can run, but I can't swim. So yeah, yeah. Sw- yeah. swimming's like, there's so much technique involved. There's technique, there's endurance. It's mm. especially when you're in a an open water situation. You've got, it's a bit crazy at the start. You're getting hit, but uh, it's got, it's exhilarating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's a lot of mental acuity and, and that, uh, very cognitive intensive you know focusing on your stroke and stuff and yeah so pretty much back then okay now we're dating back like this is i did my last race in 2012 okay. so i started racing at around 16 and we never learnt about sleep you know my coach by the way i was i was training mainly with men mm. but my coach used to say stop sleeping so much you need to be on the bike i was training five hours a day really in all legs and then my downtime was me getting massages and physical therapy so i look back then and i think we were never taught about neuroscience obviously but we were never taught about sleep and we were never even taught about nutrition so i was desperate to find out what is it that makes someone perform at their peak Mm. and what did you discover? I mean, a lot of things, but yeah. So I first of all, when I went in and started studying medicine and neurophysiology, I found out that a the nervous system, which comprises of the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, that first and foremost, that is the I call it the federal government mm. of the entire body. So that guides us. So if that's not optimized, then if you keep working down the tree then the rest of the body, our sympathetic nervous system, our parasympathetic nervous system, that's not going to be optimized. And in neuroscience, there's a bi-directional axis. So top-down processing, bottoms-up processing. So it's all intertwined. So if we're not, if we're not optimized at the, at the start of the tree, which is the brain and spinal cord, then we're just not going to be able to perform mm. in, any, in any place in life, at work, as a good husband as a good mother as a good friend i think that it all comes down to how well our brain is performing Mm. and sleep is such a critical uh, facet to brain health with repair and clearing of um you know chemicals and things like that that we synthesize during the day Mm. um so maybe let's talk about sleep first as how sleep quality sleep duration consistency how important is that And, and specifically what is that doing for um, the brain as it relates to performance. Yeah, and I, I always say that I think that being awake is like low level brain damage mm. because we are spending so much time awake. If you look back, you know, prehistoric times, we were sleeping around 12 hours a day and we were really regenerating our brain and that's what sleep is there for. But now if you ask anybody, and I ask most of my clients this, I ask them, how long did you sleep last night? And let's just say anybody says, okay, I slept for eight hours. We know that you're probably really only asleep for around seven hours because that other hour is spent tossing, turning, falling asleep. So you're not actually in sleep. So it's extremely imperative that we optimize sleep. So let's talk about the stages. Sure. So there's four stages of sleep. And stage one is when we're starting to fall asleep. We're going to stage two it's light sleep. Then we go into stage three, and this is comprised of our deep sleep. So it's also called slow wave sleep, and it's a non-REM sleep. And then we move into stage four, and this is REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And I would say that stage three and four are the most important stages, especially for our brain. So during deep sleep, 
we have the obviously we have a lot of hormones that are secreted we've got testosterone estrogen growth hormone which are really responsible for growth and repair of muscle groups but then we've also got a wonderful thing that happens during deep sleep and that's the glymphatic system so it's like a sewage system for the brain and it basically is responsible for clearing out all of the toxin and debris and in fact one of the toxins that it clears out is a protein called amyloid beta and we know that this specific protein is a hallmark in Alzheimer's disease patients. So you could say that the accumulation of these certain proteins, when they build up, they obviously cause havoc on our brain and can lead to neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, dementias. So getting into this stage is extremely important for a high-performing brain. And just to get into a bit more of how this happens, so we've got different nerve cells. Our brain is comprised of neurons, which are brain cells, and we've got all these other different cells. We have this nonsense cell, I call it. It's a, a glial cell. Basically means glue in mm -hmm. Greek. And they just bind other cells together, the neurons, which are the most important ones. And during deep sleep, they shrink. And when they shrink, it allows for our fluid in our brain, which is cerebral spinal fluid, to really go through and throw out the trash. So it has room. So all this gunk is getting washed out through the cerebral spinal fluid. So it's a really beautiful process that, you know, Mother Nature has gifted us with. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So if you're not hitting those deep stages, that yeah. stage four of sleep, these glial cells don't shrink. And so the glial, the lymph in the cerebral spinal fluid and, mm -hmm. and much more is stagnant. Yeah. And then you might get build up of these proteins and then assuming then that would lead to damage and so forth. Yeah, but it's not just that. It's not just the accumulation of these toxic proteins. It's also, you know, when you wake up and maybe you're feeling like you've got brain fog and you're just not feeling great and almost everyone experiences this. Mm -hmm. You then can ask them, you know, you can either have a look at their sleep stats if they're wearing something, but more often than not, they're not getting into deep sleep. And as a, you know, as a general rule, we want to be aiming at around, I would say, 30% of your total sleep time to be comprised of deep sleep mm. and 20% of total sleep time to be comprised of REM sleep. And then that moves on to stage four because stage three, slow wave sleep, is the deep sleep. Mm. Then stage four is REM sleep. This is where a lot of our uh, memory consolidation happens. And we can also say that that's probably where learning takes place. We've got people who are learning new skills. I've got athletes who are learning new skills. We've got students who are learning new skills. But that really takes place in that REM sleep, in that REM sleep stage. So if we're not optimizing for that, then we're not really getting our memory consolidation happening. Right. And people talk about alcohol, circadian rhythm disruption, evening light exposure, these things. Um, what's the biggest trigger or the biggest sort of modifiable factor that, that compromises both deep and REM sleep that you found with your clients? Yeah, I think, okay, first and foremost, what we see, I get a lot of people saying to me, but Louisa, I wake up during the night. It's, you know, do I have insomnia? From the data, what we see is that the biggest disruptor when it comes to insomnia is anxiety and stress. Mm. So no matter what, if you are anxious and you are stressed, it's going to either prevent you from falling asleep or it's going to wake you up in the night. And this is mainly because of the activation of our sympathetic nervous system. Mm. So that's the first thing that we need to talk about. Then the second thing is, yeah, alcohol. So alcohol or the active ingredient in alcohol, which is ethanol, is probably the biggest inhibitor of REM sleep. So staying away from alcohol and obviously just staying away from light exposure at night. And blue light blocking glasses, are good to an extent, yeah. but it's not like it's going to completely block out light. It's yeah, it's tough, and especially if you like you live in Manhattan. I mean, there's light everywhere. That's mm. a, a downside that I found with like Airbnbs or any major city. I think a lot of people are not in tune with that um, environmental light exposure and, and impact that it has. And, yeah, and how minimal. I think that there was a recent study that sort of enumerated the lux that you want. You know, before bed, two hours. I think it was less than fifty lux. And then while you're sleeping, less than five lux. And a mm. lot of people are not in those environments. 
yeah blackout curtains but one thing that i actually haven't slept without is a sleep mask mm. so i've got a, i've invested in my sleep masks so mm. i wear a sleep mask to be completely blacked out at night but i also take consideration like i have my last meal two hours before bed and this is not just because it keeps us awake through digestion but also when we eat we get a natural increase in our core body temperature mm. and we know now that in order to fall asleep and stay asleep our core body temperature needs to drop at least two degrees mm. so i'm trying to maintain that as well i'm trying to get my core body temperature dropped so i can stay asleep throughout the night mm. do you sleep better in the winter in manhattan then or it's pretty cold <laughs> well outside. i must admit i'm a, i'm pretty high tech i sleep on a temperature controlled mattress there you go. yeah okay. i'm actually freezing in new york city all the time yeah. so i optimize my my sleep environment so it's completely optimized for me good for you which one have you found to be the most helpful an eight sleep okay yeah i don't know if you've ever slept on it but the good thing is it wakes you up by increase by yeah, increasing the temperature of the bed as you wake up that's awesome yeah is there like a trial phase to run in to figure out your court? Okay. Yeah, so it combines your biometric tracking as well. So it picks up on, oh, Louise is in deep sleep now. We're going to mm. drop the temperature. She's now in REM sleep, so we're going to drop it more. Oh, she's stated that she's going to wake up at 6 a.m. So maybe at around 5.45, we'll start to heat the bed back up. That's amazing. Yeah. Do a lot of athletes, are they keen on investing in this technology? Yeah, actually, one of the biggest things that we get them to invest in is a mattress like this. And a lot of them are traveling as well. So we have... Uh, different protocols like jet lag protocols in place we have an app for them to use like their jet lag protocols on that app so they're not you know wow. chucking everything out the window that's amazing yeah uh, i know you can't mention specific names but offline you were telling me some people that you work with yeah and some pretty high level folks so i i often wonder and and see for example, you know, the Seattle Seahawks just played a game in Germany. Yeah. And that's like, I think, a 13-hour time difference or something. So for them to perform at their peak at a completely different time zone, are a lot of these professional teams in tune with this and doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes? Now, yeah. yes. So I moved to New York City in 2017 mainly because I was looking at all of these teams and I'm trying to understand why they haven't invested in sleep coaching, for example. But now we're starting to become smarter mm -hmm. and we're starting to understand the impacts of jet lag and sleep deprivation on performance. However, at the end of the day, most of these athletes, which is something I'm really trying to lobby against, they are having to get on a plane, get off a plane, uh, sleep for four hours and then have to perform the following day. Mm -hmm. Not to mention something that a lot of people don't see with these athletes is it's not just game time. They have press conferences, they have team meetings, they have uh, manager meetings all on the same day as when they're performing. Mm -hmm. So it's scary. It's a lot, a lot of potential disruption. Yeah. Um, going back to alcohol, the holidays are coming up. A lot of mm. people might be consuming more alcohol than usual. Is it the acetaldehyde, the, the byproduct that is disturbing that glial lymphatic system and so forth? Is that, I know Matthew Walker has talked about that extensively. Yeah, I think, yeah, it, it inhibits the, the action of your, like some, for example, one of it in, inhibits the action of GABA. Oh. Yeah, which is our chief inhibitory neurotransmitter, one that calms us down and relaxes us during the night. So that's going to be very disruptive. Uh, but also you've got to look at the stress that it cause, causes you. Cortisol, mm -hmm. for example, is one of the stress hormones that's going to peak when you're having something like um, a sedative like alcohol. And the other thing is a lot of people think they're falling asleep when they're having alcohol or even marijuana. But they're just sedating themselves. Mm. And a sedative is, you know, something that we use in surgery. You go in, you have propovol, it puts you into a sedative state, but it doesn't put you to sleep. You're not going into these sleep stages. Mm. So they're two different things. That's important to understand. A lot of people are self-medicating with, with THC and, and marijuana. Does that impact the cycles of the REM and deep sleep and all that? Yeah, it impacts them. And the thing that I always want to point out to people is it's not just a one-time effect. If you, I always say you're preparing for sleep the moment that you wake up. So if you have a really bad night's sleep, and let's say you, you maybe fall asleep or sedate yourself until 11 a.m., you're going to mess up your entire circadian rhythm. So you want to be optimizing for sleep daily. That's why consistency is key. So important. With meal timing, with exercise, all yeah. of this. 80% of the time, because I know we're not all robots, 
if you can sleep well 80% of the time, then that's great. Mm-hmm. I mean, 100% is better, but we're all human. Right. And so you're going back to Australia soon. Mm. Will you start shifting your, like when you're falling asleep here and maybe change your feeding windows and stuff like that? Like- yeah. So um, I follow an app where you input your plane times, actually. So you input like your planes and it tells you when to have caffeine, when to not have light. And so I... I, I go to LA first and I'll have a two day layover there mm. just to help my body. And in fact, some of the best research that's out there that you know talks about sleep deprivation on planes says that you should try and get as much sleep as possible before you get on the plane. Like sleep banking, they call it. Sleep banking, yeah. That's a real deal. Yeah, it's especially, when you, especially when you're about to travel. Really important. You know, I like to travel just like anyone, and I, I do get con- concerned with the staff, the pilots. You see them, like, they're flying internationally in different time zones. There could be bad weather, and you see them eating McDonald's. Like, that's always a scary thing, seeing the pilots come on the plane with McDonald's. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what? I mean, this, you know, it's one thing to optimize for making more money or performing as an athlete, but as in society, we have people driving cars, you know, operating trains. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a real, real thing. So... How much of an effect does some of that, you know? Oh, yeah, that comes into the cognitive processes. So our prefrontal cortex, which lives in our frontal lobe just here behind our forehead, is the is the ruler of our brain and that's where our cognition happens. Things such as attention, Mm -hmm. reaction time, processing speed. Now, when it comes to the literature on sleep deprivation, they when they when they want to study that, they take into account drivers who have had accidents, and they can see that a driver who has slept for six hours is I think they increase their rate of having an accident by thirty three percent once they've slept for six hours, and six hours is a sleep deprived state wow. in the scientific literature. Yeah, there's just so much to be said about reaction time. Even they do a lot on surgeons, you know how well they're able to make sound decisions when they're operating, but also NBA players. Um, Shereen Maher, uh, she's a a wonderful physician who's looked at the effects of sleep deprivation on point scores of NBA players. Yeah, and she actually did a sleep extension protocol and saw that they increased their free throws, their reaction time on the court just by extending their sleep by about an hour. That's amazing. Mm. You know, I think it's great to have these conversations because some of us just have a bad day periodically. We make a poor decision. We almost get in a car accident. We overreact with our loved ones and things like that. And it, it's these simple fixes that could impact like our sleep, which impacts our mood the next day. Mm. So it's it's really important to... Which impacts what we eat, our decisions to not eat the donut or eat the donut, the decision to drink more water, not drink water. Really important because... Based upon what you said, I inferred that the the part of the brain that's impacted the most by, say, poor nutrition, sleep deprivation, is the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's you were talking about some folks that you uh, clients of yours that you coach mm. that are on Wall Street and so forth, mm. and and their decision making over time, they're noticing, they're observing that they're not making the same level of decisions and so forth. So it seems like when we're younger, we can get away with yeah. fast food, alcohol. Four, four hours of sleep at night, yeah. but it catches up with us later. And that's because as we age, we have a, a natural aging in our brain. And there's many hypotheses for this. There's, there's many. And I think the, the best ones that stand out to me are first and foremost is one that states that as we age, we have a lower efficacy of our frontal lobe. Okay. So that means that as we age, our frontal lobe, we get thinning of our cerebral cortex. So if we get thinning of this cerebral cortex, especially in the prefrontal cortex, this means that we're not going to be able to make decisions the same as what we did in our 20s. So we get a lower decision rate. We get a worsening of our processing speed, inhibition, impulse control, all of these things that we just have natural to us just declines as we get older Mm. so that then affects the way we think at work the way we make decisions the way we spend money the way we choose to argue with our partners it all it all plays it's all related it's all related now this process it's amenable to lifestyle change like it happens but it doesn't happen it doesn't have to happen at the rate that it does correct we can slow down the brain aging process through lifestyle interventions such as sleep good nutrition and of course, exercise. Um, there's another theory that states that as we get older, we have a dysregulation in our white 
white matter. So the brain is comprised of gray matter and white matter. And white matter is where all of our myelinated neurons live. And so this is where we have our, that's where our conduction velocities happen, like speed of thought, for example, happens on the white part or the white matter of our brain. So as we get older, we have a, an atrophy of our white matter. And so if we have an atrophy of white matter, that means that, of course, another thing is our processing speed is going to decline. And so that's another scary thing as well. And you can assess for this. We can assess for this, yeah. Mm -hmm. So with the specific tool that we use, we use an EEG. It's an electroencephalogram. And it's like the cap that you put on your head. You've got all these leads coming out of it. And you mainly see it in an epilepsy ward or if you're going to check for a seizure. Mm -hmm. But what this is doing is it's scanning the brain waves. Okay, so we put this we put this on and we measure brainwave activity, but we can also measure the functionality of somebody's brain. Mm. And let's just take one of our uh, one of our clients on Wall Street. So he's uh, 52 now, and he came to us and said, "Louisa, I don't know what's happening. I'm just seeing a decline in my performance." I'm just, you know, he assessed the market. So the market was good. His team was good. Same software, but he's just, he's just, things are just, he's just seeing a decline. He didn't know what was happening. So I scanned his brain and we did a full visual acuity test. Uh, we did a full brain map with his eyes open, his eyes closed, and we're able to see where, so it does a normative database. You're able to see how old is his brain. Okay. So he's, it was in, he was in his very early 50s. I think he was around 49 at the time. Now he's 52. His brain was the same as a 65-year-old. So he had an accelerated brain age. And I asked him, okay, let's go back in time and figure out why. The guy was sleeping four to five hours a night. He was self-medicating with alcohol because he had such a high-stress job. He had millions of dollars that he had to take care of. He couldn't deal with that. And you know what? He wasn't exercising. Mm. So that there is a cocktail of disaster that led to his accelerated brain aging. Wow, that's mm. scary. So having that objective data, mm. you know, it's one thing to tell someone, hey, if you could perform better if you eat better food and exercise, and they might say, sure, whatever, I'll do it when I can. But seeing that your brain has actually accelerated yeah. in its aging process, that I think is a powerful um, motivating factor for some people to actually take this stuff seriously mm, absolutely so a test like that um you probably have to someone has to come out and see you in person to do that mm. and what would something like that cost uh well it depends if you do it privately or if you actually go into a an actual office like a a, a hospital and do that you're probably looking at around 1500 2000 okay yeah and is there, um, is it one technology, like one system? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, the cap is itself a, an EEG cap, but then that connects to a specific software, which will then give you the report. So we get uh, two types of report. We get a raw data EEG, but then we also get a QEEG, which is a quantitative um, electroencephalogram. So it gives you the measurements of someone's brain in different regions so it can say this part of the brain is not lighting up when it needs to this part of the brain is hyperactive this part is hypoactive so it's so we can pick up on what area of the brain isn't performing at its peak what area is that's amazing yeah and then once you know that um Obviously, there's global things like sleep, nutrition that we've been talking about, exercise. Yeah. But are there more specific, like, let's say, is the language like the Warren Keys area or something? Like, the so if area. there is specific areas, then you can fine tune those areas. Yeah. This? Well, the the thing, the reason why this was actually, you know, invented, like in the way that I was meant to be using it and the way that I was using it was to pick up on mild cognitive impairment. Mm. Now, MCI is a pre-dementia state. So I was just seeing hundreds and hundreds of people coming in just checking for MCI. And that's what we were checking for. And, and that's great because we can say, hey, listen, you've got mild cognitive impairment. We can then move on to the next stage, which you know you can do blood biomarkers, you can do a genetic test to see if they've got the genes for Alzheimer's disease. So it's pretty much the the first stop to detecting early onset Alzheimer's disease. Mm. But everybody has a brain. So I was thinking, well, why are we not testing this on everyone? Everyone should see the functionality of their brain. Mm. So that's when I started doing that. 
Good for you. Yeah. That's amazing. Now, how many other clinicians like you are doing this throughout the U.S., do you think? Is it I don't know. hundreds, dozens? Not many. Yeah. No, which is why I think I, I get to work with such a high-level elite athletes. That is so awesome. Yeah. It's a, a shame because, you know, we go to the doctor. We, you know, most people get an anal physical. They look at rudimentary biomarkers, blood glucose, cholesterol, triglycerides, whatever. Um, and we can triangulate from those markers. Oh, well, because you're insulin resistant, they're data suggests that you might be at higher risk for future Alzheimer's, so change your diet. But having a quantitative assessment on your brain, I think, should be part of like an anal physical. Yeah, um, I forget, I think it was Dale Bredesen that um, has said that we should get an annual uh, cognoscopy. It's amazing. Yeah, so just picking up on how well your brain is functioning, but here's the thing, I don't want, you know, I, my thesis is everyone should be working on their brain because it is the control center of your entire body and i say this because as we get older and we we have a decline in these in these decision making abilities and processing speed it's upsetting that at age 70 80 that we have to be prone to those but we don't have to we can starve off these pre-dementia states we can starve off these slowing of our cognition through exercise and guess what it's free yes this is that's amazing Okay, you've worked with a lot of people. How many people have come in and you're like, wow, your brain is amazing. Like it's actually younger than your biologic or your chronologic age. Is that common or? I did see, uh, yeah, I did see one man who I said, oh my God, you are unbelievable. But he was, he was doing, um, he had a a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Mm -hmm. So he was doing that. He had a cold plunge. He had a sauna. He was doing absolutely everything that, in hindsight, it's like, well, if should everyone be doing that? Not should, but he, you know, he invested heavily on his brain. Mm-hmm. And why was it? Because a family member got dementia, or he just wanted to perform at his best? He made a lot of money, yeah. and he sold his company, and he saw his parents uh, pass away of dementia, mm, and true. he made it his mission to literally spend all of his money turning his house into a, a chamber it is it is really incredible wow that's yeah. amazing i was going to say I, i've watched documentaries of um cristiano ronaldo mm-hmm. and he does if i could scan his brain it would probably look like a 23 year old that's amazing yeah i mean that's what's great about the brain is it is very plastic right it, and amenable to these different changes and modifiable um for people that have had head trauma played mm. um and we see this in the media a lot. I, I, I used to play football, so I watched athletes. And then it seems like late 30s, early 40s, you start to see these behavioral changes where they make poor business decisions or they start getting more involved in drugs and alcohol. Um, how does the head trauma, does it really accelerate the de- degradation of the prefrontal cortex? Oh, well, it depends on where you get hit. But I could say that I started working with NFL athletes because I saw a crossover between CTE, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. If you look at the pathology of it, one part of it states that they also have an accumulation of tau proteins and amyloid beta, which is somewhat comparable to Alzheimer's disease. And I remember asking, I was working with a, um, he was a double board certified neurologist. And I said to him, I said, listen, what if we start scanning uh, NFL players who have had concussions and he basically said just stick to what you're doing mm. I was like okay so I made it my mission to go out and, and start this process with NFL players and let me tell you it's really scary and scary for many reasons one when it comes to head trauma depending on the velocity at which you get hit and the impact that should determine the recovery and so if you just have a, a light hit you may not need a weak recovery mm. but if you get hit really hard you should take at least a month off. But unfortunately, they're not taking a month off. So what you're seeing is just like if you were to get a hit and you get a bruise on your your arm, Mm -hmm. if you don't let that heal and then someone goes and hits you again, it's going to be worse off. And that's what's happening in the brain. This trauma is happening and you, you can heal it with the right mechanisms. We know that we can heal it by decreasing the temperature of your of your brain if you can um, by eating a high fat diet mainly uh, like a ketogenic diet or having exogenous ketones it 24 hours after a post-traumatic insult we can do this but these players aren't so they're just going out and they're putting more stress on their brain and over time this then leads to pathologies like cte 
Right. And it's scary. That is scary. Um, there was an example here uh, recently with a Miami Dolphins quarterback. Several weeks in a row, just you could see it wasn't even the hit, but then falling, and then his head was bouncing on the turf. Yeah, and that I think is is even worse, right? Because it's that whiplash. It's the whiplash. Yeah, it's it's literally your head going back and forth, and you're just messing with. You've got the metabolites. You've also your brain is very soft, mm. and it's just mushed in. You know, it's just going slamming from side to side with the skull. It's so traumatic. I'm uh, so I decided. To not work with NFL athletes anymore. Really? Yeah, I made a really hard decision, and um, it's just too scary. Literally, literally, like what get, I see. Yeah. For you, it's like you get sad. I get very sad, mm-hmm. um, and also because you see the back end where they feel forced to keep playing. It's, that's a tough thing. Yeah. So it's probably hard for you just to even you don't watch football. Yeah. Right? It's like, but also because in or if you if you were really true to what you believe in when you see these scans you have to say the only way to get over this is by taking time off and by increasing the amount of epa dha that you're having Mm -hmm. uh maybe having exogenous ketones uh, going into a a hyperbaric oxygen like but they won't do that so they don't want to or no one from the team is suggesting it no one from the team is suggesting it but also it takes a lot of time and they will have to you can't they can't take time off from work wow they have to play so and if they don't play then they don't feed their family so i uh, you know what i mean so it's a vicious cycle yeah that is tough um more practical for most people that have children like sometimes i'll see my daughter or kids playing and they bump their heads or they Mm. fall um as a parent maybe you don't immediately go and run out and get a brain scan but maybe Mm -hmm. you could say okay well there could be some some micro trauma here Mm -hmm. maybe let's eat a low carb diet or ketogenic diet for a week yeah could that be something that could be helpful no that's a really good thing so um i read a wonderful study uh many years ago that showed that uh, ingesting exogenous ketones so ketones that you we naturally produce ketones but ketones that you don't uh, produce and you take them through a drink um, this can be great for preventing trauma from happening to the brain so ingesting uh these exogenous ketones prior to going and and i don't know having a soccer match if it's high risk but even if you haven't let's just say your kid does hit their head and you want to start an intervention immediately because you've got a a window a 24-hour window Mm. so that intervention may be you know high fat ketogenic diet that's amazing yeah you know, it's interesting. So my father back in 2017 got in a bike accident and mm-hmm. got a concussion, didn't remember what happened and so forth. And so I just so happened to have some keto ester with me. Oh, wow. And so we were cranking that high. And since then, he has, he's had no, um, you know, observable cognitive decline associated with that. Um, but at the time, it was hard for me to find the research. But I know clinicians are doing this and have been, mm. you know, sometimes, well, oftentimes clinicians are ahead of the science, right? Because mm. it takes you know, case studies and things and then randomized controlled trials. But um, yeah, I think a lot of people are not aware of that. No. And so if their kid is playing sports or going to do a, a bike race where there's a, a high, you know, incidence or probability that you might hit your head, even a triathlon, I've seen some crazy accidents when it's windy. I've been in one, I used to race, you know, semi-professional cycling and got a major concussion and yeah. I didn't have all these tools back then. I didn't no. know. Um, and I made a really poor decision, <laughs> side story. So I ordered, in my business, I, I use flyers. Yeah. And in the order, I wanted 100. Yeah. And the next, I, it was, I got in this accident on, on Saturday, made the order on Sunday, and I went to go pick up the print, and it was, there was 1,400. Oh, no. Because on the computer, so you ma- yeah. I didn't even know that I, I saw this guy coming out with a dolly of all these things. I'm like, that's not my job. He's like, uh, Mike Mutzel? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Like, I did not order 1400 but I did because I had a mild concussion. See what I mean? And sometimes you just don't know. And imagine you were on the road and you just maybe not saw a car coming. Yeah. And so that's, that's really scary in and of itself. Totally. So I think, yeah, summary, recap of where we are so far. People should get a cognoscopy yeah. yeah well that wasn't my thing that's something that yeah dale bredesen and he's um yeah he's amazing at what he yeah yeah and he does now you mentioned epa dha yes huge um, long chain fats there are some people on the internet that say oh my gosh these things are toxic they're highly oxidizable Have really you... yeah it's in a it's a kind of a, a fringe group mm. but i think they're confusing the polyunsaturated seed oils mm. like the the 16 carbon, 18 carbon fats with the EPA and DHA mm. um, that are inherently anti-inflammatory. Mm. 
And so um, we've had Bill Harris, William Harris. Who, oh, he's amazing. So the omega-3 index, is that something that you recommend? Huge. Actually, our omega-3 index can do many things. It can first and foremost tell you if you have a high omega-3 index, and this is 8% or more, because a lot of people are in the United States are actually below 8%. You can increase your life expectancy by five years by having a high omega-3 index. And what we're finding now is um, we have a report on risk factors for all-cause mortality. There's many of them, cardiovascular disease. One of them now is a low omega-3 index. This can accelerate your rate to death, I would say. So it's so imperatively important to understand your omega-3 index score. Mm -hmm. I'm at around 13.5%. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to get uh, to the same as a dolphin. So um, I'm ingesting high levels of EPA, DHA. Now your question around toxicity, what I think that this comes down to is the quality of the supplement. Yeah. We can get supplements uh, on the internet from God knows where, or we can get it from a reputable brand. And that then can obviously help with the you know, oxidization and toxicity level. But from my understanding, if you're not ingesting EPA, DHA, you're doing yourself a real big disservice because it helps with, first and foremost, when it comes to the brain, it helps feed your brain what it's made of. Your brain is really made of water and fat. So you're really helping your brain you know, feed it that way. Yeah. But also your brain... And your cells in your body, the brain cells in your brain and the cells in your body need to be able to run smoothly. And this helps with having a high omega-3 index, helps with cell membrane fluidity. So we, we need that as well. Totally. Yeah. And so how many grams are you taking of EPA DHA? I'm having two grams of each per day. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought it was going to be higher. That That's doable. For that's four people. grams all day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, my father in 2019, he had a right parietal lobe infarct. So he had a stroke. It was minor. But since then, his cognition has declined immensely. For somebody like this and for somebody who may have had a concussion, you might want to up it. And I do to six grams per day. Okay. So three grams of each. And then so the dolphin omega-3 index... Or where is that? In I think that's around a uh, uh, like seventeen percent. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Now, it's really interesting that we talk about omega three index with mm. Bill Harris because what they're testing there is the red blood cell. So they're testing the omega three within a red blood cell, and if you go through and just do a an omega three through a, a normal standard blood panel, they're not testing the red blood cell because our red blood cells cycle over it lasts about 120 days so the relatively long half-life so you're mm. testing it within there what i see is that people go and test their omega-3s and they're testing it based on maybe if they had fish the other night yeah. so they're not getting the true measurement of omega-3 that's really important mm. and what's nice about that test is that it's a net home test 49 dollars oh, really affordable very affordable accessible little finger stick send it off you get the report yeah and when it comes to obviously omega-3 it's not going to just happen overnight you don't just ingest two or three. you have to do it daily mm -hmm. and it's just it's incredible for cardiac health for brain health for overall health i think it's important um i stopped taking fish oil for a little while you know we have backyard chickens and eat grass-fed all this stuff and, and my omega-3 index, index came back at 5.1 percent which is oh, wow. really low yeah um and so i think a lot of the perception for people is like oh well i eat all these healthy foods, so therefore my omega-3 index might be high, but when they actually quantify this, and mm. they're like, wow, it's really, I'm doing subpar. Yeah, you know? they should go and watch it. I think everyone should go and watch this documentary that'll change their, their mind about the foods that we're ingest ingesting. It's called Seaspiracy. Oh, that is a good one. Yeah, yeah, so unfortunately, a lot of the fish that we're having now is laced with microplastics and a lot of other things. And I'm not, uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but uh, when you watch this, it's, it's very scary to think, well, no wonder we're not getting, you know, a lot of people are eating fish, but they've still got a low omega-3 index. Mm -hmm. And for fish, it might be tilapia or shrimp or mm -hmm. something that is farm raised. And don't those um, fish that are, you know, farm grown in that environment, they don't have the same numbers. They don't, no, they don't have the same numbers. Um, and... I also think one thing that we need to point out, because I get asked this a lot, Louisa, I'm a vegan or I eat plant-based. So when we look at omega-3, mm -hmm. 
Mm. And it's made of three parts, EPA, DHA, and ALA. Now, ALA is the plant form, and a lot of people get this from flax seeds or chia seeds. But to get the recommended dose of omega-3s just through ALA, you'd have to have a lot. And ALA gets converted into DHA. So it's a it, it crosses a few things before it gets into what you need it to be. Mm-hmm. So to have to just rely on ALA is um, is hard because you have to up it a lot. Yeah, the, yeah, that conversion. You're eating a ton of flax or yeah. you know, chia. Um, okay, another follow up question on, on the vegan. I'll wait for that. Uh, it's kind of controversial. Yeah. Um, but Andrew Huberman talks about how the eyes are essentially neurologic tissues that the only neurologic tissue that exists outside the brain. Mm. And one thing that I found when people get a concussion, they can't see as well. Mm. Um, People will say, I, I see younger and younger people now wearing glasses. They, mm. Their vision has changed. It is, I don't know, the re, I haven't done the research on this, but we know with the olfactory bulb, it mm. atrophies. So people, mm. their smell changes. So it seems that a one way to triangulate, if you don't have access to a practitioner like you in terms of doing a cognoscopy annually, which I think would be phenomenal, vision changes. Mm. Um, do you think that's a way to sort of assess indirectly brain health yeah i mean so when it comes to vision and andrew it obviously andrew said it's two pieces of the brain and so what is happening is your eye is connected to the brain via the optic nerve and that's actually one of the things that we test so as a mm. also as a neurophysiologist one thing that you get trained in is um, testing visual acuity through visually evoked potentials and that's something that we do with the brain scan so we're able to pick up on a the measurement of how well the optic nerve is processing that information. So the optic nerve, you see the information, it goes to the back of the brain at the occipital cortex and it tells your brain, okay, this is a a lamp or this is number two and then it sends that message to the frontal part of the brain where it makes out the reasoning. Now we can see, oh, after a a concussion, they have a delayed, it's called a P100 score, okay? And we see, oh, you've got a delay or a prolonged P100 latency. This means maybe you've got inflammation of the optic nerve and this may be caused from a concussion. So we can pick up on that. But one of the good markers is uh, memory, you know, after a concussion, you know, assess memory, maybe get someone to remember a few things. Um, and then, yeah, poor poor vision is, is huge. Interesting. Mm. Um, okay, it's not really controversial, but I've seen- in the last several years, I've seen a lot of irrational behavior, um, not just in my own community, but it, from a society perspective. And I see, obviously, a lot of poor nutrition, under-exercise, uh, people are staying at home more, blah, blah, blah. Do you think that there's a lot more people with suboptimal brain health in society compared to maybe in the last 30 years due to poor nutrition and things like that? Because there's a lot of impulsivity and reaction and this, this idea of like cancel culture and not thinking through critically. Uh, I know it's controversial and we have no evidence to really point to this, but do you think that we're starting to see like accelerated brain aging even amongst young people? 100%. I was actually trying to, you know, I was, I've been researching some of the biggest problems in society and then also i was looking at the um the data on death rates uh, of 2019 and a lot of them are attributable to either cut you know heart disease and brain diseases which whether it's a stroke and or whether it's uh, alzheimer's disease but yeah we are we are doing behaviors okay i don't i wouldn't go out there and say we're staying home we're being impulsive and this is because of brain health but Really, if we if we look at the brain and look at what a healthy performing brain entails, it is being able to sit and make sound decisions and being able to be rational and impulsivity mm. is being you can practice, you know, impulse control, which is a cognitive state. Mm. So, yes, I could definitely say that things that we're doing to accelerate the brain aging process is interfering with um, modern day society. Yes. If I look, if I keep reverse engineering it and thinking why, I honestly think it comes down to misinformation uh, and lack of education. Yeah. So this is why I am so grateful for you and what you do. You put out education, but people have to engage in that. Ed- you have to want to learn about what the brain is, what it does, and how to take care of it. Mm-hmm. So important. 
With regards to impulse control, is that the prefrontal cortex that's mm-hmm. mediating that? Yeah. Okay. And then if we think about critical thinking, I know there's a lot of probably where brain regions involved, but mm. is that also a prefrontal cortex process? Yeah, but then there's also different areas. So the prefrontal cortex, you know, sends information to different areas of the brain and the amygdala is part of it. And then we've got different areas like that are responsible for emotional control and I always tell people at any given moment, if you are not eating well, sleeping well and exercising, you're going, your brain is going to fatigue faster and therefore you won't have the brain energy to be rational, mm. to think properly. That's what this is all about. You have to have the brain energy to do these things. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And what about trauma? We know a lot of, unfortunately, young women are abused sexually and it happens to boys as well. Um, People are in bad relationships and stuff. You mentioned the amygdala uh, and stress and so forth. How much, when you do brain scans, if you had two people, one that was abused or one that wasn't, does that impact processing speed and all these functional parameters? So what I think that this comes down to is someone's, you know, have they been able to heal okay and if they haven't then it just comes down to stress and an inflamed brain Mm -hmm. really because that's the biggest thing that gets in the way that's what disrupts these pathways from your prefrontal cortex to talk to any other area of the brain we see that that's where stress lies and that's where our emotions our inability to react emotionally sound um is the it's this crosstalk it's this pathway that's stopping it and Inflammation, neural inflammation is a big part of that. Mm. Yeah. Speaking of neural inflammation, people have, especially early on with COVID, just having a COVID infection, just, and we all have probably have it at this point, right? Um, was linked with accelerated um, degradation of the brain. There mm. was some interesting research. Have you been following that? I stayed away from that. But when it comes to neural inflammation, I actually posted something which was really fascinating. And it was around type 2 diabetes and obesity and there was a a, a, this study specifically was done in mice and what they found was people who are in that obese range actually have a higher rate of neural inflammation Mm. and that was that was really interesting to me because i was figuring out well what are the mechanisms to control this neural inflammation so that's the extent of it i try and stay away from the whole COVID. i just know that long-term COVID uh does induce neural inflammation and yeah yeah interesting Okay, myokines, exercise, um, so much to unpack there. And what's unique that I think is in the last several years, we're learning that muscle is a secretory organ. Yes. It releases these factors that go systemic and impact fat cell release of, of stored lipids and mm. all of this. I know it's a big you know, interest of yours as well. Um, let's talk, <clears throat> talk about the importance of exercise as mm. it relates to brain, but also metabolic health. Oh, I love this area. I think uh, myokines are going to be the huge, huge topic of research. It's something that I'm researching a lot. So when we exercise, we have uh, a release of myokines. Now, they are muscle-based proteins, let's just call them. Um, and when they're released from the skeletal muscle, they can then go out and act on different organs in the body in positive ways. There's only one out of the 600 myokines that have now been identified. There's over 600. Um, There's only one that I've really seen that has a negative effect. But um, these myokines are absolutely brilliant. So they are hormones. Now, when it comes to hormones, we've got peptide hormones and we've got steroid hormones. So these are peptide hormones. So they're water soluble. So they are some of them can cross the blood brain barrier and what this means is the way that they affect other organs in the body is we have these little receptors binding receptors if you will on skeleton on i would say heart muscle on our spleen on our liver and they they're just opened and they sit like this and they allow they for these little peptide hormones to just go and lodge in there and then it creates a chemical reaction which has positive effects so that's a bit about the, the breakdown of a myokine. So we know now that we have specific myokines. So let's take IL-6, interleukin-6, for example. This is the most well-studied myokine. It gets secreted when we have a contraction of a muscle. So when you shorten a muscle, okay, and we contract it during a bicep curl, let's just imagine, it releases 
these myocans. The first one we'll talk about is IL-6. We know IL-6 to be this pro-inflammatory cytokine. And that's well and truly true. But when it's released specifically from the muscle, it acts as an anti-inflammatory. So it goes through and it acts as a anti-inflammatory and it can have a, an effect on our immunity and it can have an effect on different areas of the brain, which is fantastic. The second one is irisin. Now, irisin was only founded in 2012 and this, it actually comes from the Greek, it was named after a Greek god and his name was Iris, and he was a messenger to the gods. And so this is what irisin does. So when it's released, it acts as a messenger molecule. So it goes through, and it can actually cross the blood-brain barrier and have an effect. It goes specifically to the prefrontal cortex and also to the hippocampus. And it has an effect, A, when it goes to the prefrontal cortex, it has an effect on cognition. So it can increase our cognitive processes, the ones that we've spoken about. But then when it goes into the hippocampus, what it does is it induces another myokine called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. So it helps BDNF. It's like a little pal and it says, come on, you can do it. And BDNF then gets released even more because it has the help of irisin. And when that happens, we can actually induce neurogenesis in this area of the brain, which is the hippocampus is um, it's stored just you know in our temporal lobes, which is behind our ears, deep within there. And this is where a lot of our memory formations happen. It's one of the, the first things to go during uh, Alzheimer's disease pathologies. So it goes in to this area of the brain and it creates new brain cells. And I think that that is incredible. And it can also have an effect on the subregions of the hippocampus. Wow. Yeah. That is so amazing. So would it be advantageous for people when they're exercising to also be learning at the same time? Or is there a post-exercise window where learning takes place? Or should just this be a maintenance thing? Like, is there a t- temporal relation here? That's actually a really good question. So actually, there's um, studies that show that when you learn something and then immediately go and exercise, you can have greater capacity to remember the learning that just took place. Wow. But this takes into consideration adrenaline and other things. Mm-hmm. There's also... Um, Another study that they did where if you sleep for 20 minutes straight after learning something, you'll embed everything you learned. That's so that's a whole new area. But uh, when it comes to irisin, I think this this is just, and growing the, the hippocampal subregions, I think this is amazing. And what the studies show in humans as well is that you get a massive increase of irisin one hour after you exercise, and this can last And immediately, if you stop exercising, let's just say you're exercising regularly Mm. for 12 weeks and you stop, you will stop the release of irisin as well. Wow. Uh, So another, you know, incredible myokine that that we know. And when it comes to protocols, you have to be working hard. This is the thing. You can't just walk outside and get a robust release of irisin. Mm -hmm. You really have to be working and you have to be working at around 70 to 80% of your one repetition max. Okay, that was gonna be my follow-up question. Is there any differences between aerobic versus you know, resistance type exercise? And it sounds like it's more based, the irisin release is more specific to resistance training. Yeah, you can get it from um, aerobic physical activity as well. However, Mm. it's more prolific. You get more of a release during resistance training. And Mm. this is hard, right? Because you have to keep, because your one repetition max is going to change as you get stronger. So you have to, you have to really be trying hard at the gym. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, that's another motivator for people to to push it because I think a lot of people have limitations or I don't want to get too big. You know, some women think they're going to get bulky, but knowing this, like, Hey, I need to like keep pushing myself yeah, and stay with it, you know, uh, to protect my brain. Yeah. There's, um, there's another one called cathepsin B. So there's lactate. So all of these have the ability to get secreted from the skeletal muscle and act on endocrine organs and, but also act on the brain. And if we can understand this, if we can understand that weight training specifically, because you have to have resistance, that's what it is. It's not just, it's having a resistance against the muscle, uh, uh, against the muscle tendon, okay, or against the muscle itself. And the more resistance that we have there, the more release we get. Mm. Or if you're doing 
um, aerobic, so it'd be like sprinting, like high explosive, because that's a lot of resistance. Yeah, sprinting, and um, yeah, when they did these studies with Iris, and they showed that it was large bouts of endurance running. Mm, high volume. High volume, which makes sense because you're contracting your muscles when you do that, right? Yeah, that's yeah. so fascinating. It seems like when it comes to BDNF specifically, mm. and I love how you related irisin to BDNF mm. signaling, there has been a sort of bias in the research favoring aerobic exercise. Mm -hmm. But it seems like in the last three to four years, the studies mechanistically showing myokine release and this and that has started to pivot more towards resistance training. Yeah, and this is because when we first did the relationship between, when we first went out and studied the relationship between brain health and physical activity okay they could really you start with rodent models so you start with mice and it was very hard you know back in the you know 1980s to study resistance training with mice so they first started with uh getting them to run on a wheel okay and what they found was that after six months of aerobic physical activity, they were able; these mice were able to grow new neurons in the hippocampus. So that's when they first realized, oh my God, there is a relationship between brain between brain health and physical activity. So it wasn't until uh, I think the early 2000s that they really started to understand the role that resistance training plays with uh, brain health. And they found that's when they found the myokines. They found that this is incredible for brain health but it's not just brain health specifically in cognition it's also starving off alzheimer's disease as they started to do more research they found that you can starve off these neurodegenerative dis diseases and states by 20 years wow. if you just induce these um, exercise protocols really important especially for apoe 4 carriers yeah i mean mm. Is that, what do you think about the risk factors in terms of people with, that it carry one allele of it? One, yeah, one or two, you're actually increasing by tenfold. Yeah, I think you've got the three, uh, is it a three, yeah, three times more risk for, for one, or if you've got two, it's six times. It's, yeah. it's devastating and it's scary. But I don't think that that's the scary thing. I think that we're seeing now five uh 50 million people worldwide are affected by alzheimer's disease and that number is said to triple by the year 2050 and it's not just from people carrying or possessing the e4 allele it is now well then why is this okay so if the pathology is tau proteins and amyloid beta which now there's a lot of controversy around and this is due to uh, a fraudulent study that was done and I'm, I'm sure you know about this um but why if we let's just say there is somebody a perfectly he healthy person who doesn't possess the genes the e4 e4 what is it why do they end up with alzheimer's disease we've spoken about it if you don't get into deep sleep and you have more of an accumulation of these proteins think about it like compound interest mm. over time it's not just one night you get a little bit of the proteins but they build up over 20 30 years if we know now that EPA and DHA can go through and clear these hallmarks, they can literally go through and ameliorate these hallmarks, these um, amyloid B proteins. That may be one of the reasons, you know, a low omega-3 index. We know that um, irisin and exercise, uh, myokines and exercise from resistance training can go through and have an effect of these, then maybe that's that's the reason why we're just walking ourselves into neurodegenerative diseases. It's so important. I don't think people are, are as aware of the prevalence of this. And if you look at mortality statistics, just here in the US, Alzheimer's dementia, I believe it's number four. Um, mm. And it has been for the last several years. And, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people every year dying from this condition. And the treatments for this, once there's a diagnosis, are not really good at restoring the brain back to its original function. So. I love that you're helping us to learn these tangible ways to get out in front of it, which is really, really great. Yeah, it's scary. And something that we see um, as well, which I'll just uh, add in is, you know, in the neurophysiology lab, okay, you, you're looking at a lot of demyelinating disorders, mm -hmm. things such as, such as multiple sclerosis and where, you know, um, chronic inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy. It's these things are now more prevalent. And although, they are sporadic, meaning that 70 to 80 percent of these cases are sporadic, meaning they just come out of nowhere and physicians cannot tell you where. There is a small amount of research that's being done now, and I don't want to say this is the truth, but this is 
what we're seeing is research saying that high stress environments and chronic stress is leading to some of these demyelinating diseases as well. Wow. And we're all so stressed now, which is chronic stress, chronic cortisol. So that's so bad. Louisa, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing all this amazing wisdom and practical tips. Um, so you work with clients and then you also share a lot of content on mm -hmm. your your site and Instagram. If yeah. folks want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Definitely come and find me on Instagram. I'm very active, Louisa Nicola. Um, and that's yeah. Where all your stuff, yeah, is all my stuff is located. And people can work with you, they fly into New York and... Well, actually we're uh, releasing our uh, online program, which is literally just an introduction to a high performing brain. So we go into sleep, nutrients and, uh, and exercise and the protocols associated with that and all the studies associated with that and it's going to be online. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And actually we can make a discount code for you if they use code Mike. Okay. You can get $100 off. Awesome. Yeah. Lisa, thank you so much for coming on. This thank you great. so much.